Welcome to Fireside Gaming. I'm Billum, and we're diving into one of my favorite JRPGs of all times, Wild Arms. Wild Arms is an interesting game, as it was one of the first JRPGs to come out on the PlayStation 1 in the United States. That probably sounds strange since everyone knows just how much of a JRPG machine the PS1 is, but that wasn't always the case. See, Sony Computer Entertainment of America wasn't actually all that fond of releasing JRPGs on the console. They treated the genre much like they did 2D games on the platform, which is to say they went out of their way to keep them from releasing in the US. This was due to their belief that the genre wouldn't perform well, as well as their desire for 3D games that would show off what the console can do. That actually led to a bit of a fight between them and Capcom over Mega Man and Mega Man X. That pseudo-ban on JRPGs was lifted in times for Wild Arms' release in April 1997, which was shortly after the launch of Final Fantasy VII in the US in January 1997. Just to note, Wild Arms launched in Japan one month before the release of Final Fantasy VII. We're going to start covering the story of Wild Arms now, so if you want to avoid spoilers, now's the time to dip out. This is a long one, so I'll include a time skip above. Wild Arms takes place on the planet of Phil Gaia. 1,000 years ago, humans in the Elu, alongside the Guardians of the Planet, took part in a great war against an invading race called the Metal Demons. A quick note here, I'll be using Metal Demons and Demons interchangeably throughout this review, just giving you a heads up to avoid confusion. Alright, so these demons traveled to Phil Gaia following the destruction of their own planet, named Hades. I know what you're thinking. Demons from Hades. How original. But stick with me here. The war against the demons was won, pushing the enemy back into the harsh arctic lands in the north of Phil Gaia. But it wasn't without sacrifice. The final weapon used against the demons, the Guardian Blade, sucked the very life from a large portion of the planet when used against the metal demons. As a result, a large stretch of Phil Gaia is now desert, and that desert is slowly spreading to the rest of the planet. As if that wasn't bad enough, the Elu fled Phil Gaia following the battle. Their race is closely tied to the planet, and with it slowly dying, the ancient race had no choice but to leave their home if they want to continue living. And the final nail in the coffin is the diminished power of the Guardians. They were weakened from the battle, and humanity has lost their faith in them over the last millennia. Now they are only treated as legends, with few people still actively worshipping them. Moving to the present day, the story of Wild Arms follows a trio of characters that will come together in a new battle against the Metal Demons. Let's start with Rudy Rough Knight. Yes, that's his real name, and I love it. Rudy is what's known as a Dream Chaser. This is a term that the residents of Phil Gaia apply to adventurers. Some of them are out in search of treasures, others seek out ancient ruins, while plenty of others simply live a nomadic lifestyle. Rudy lives in the small village of Surf and is a recent addition to the populace. He joined the town with the mayor's approval and helps out to earn his keep. Unfortunately, trouble befalls the town when a man grows ill and his young son, Tony, seeks out the cure in a forbidden cave. Rudy chases after the boy. He stops him from progressing further into the cave and agrees to find the holly berry for him. While successful in getting the berry, this causes an earthquake that releases an ancient beast sealed in the cavern. Rudy battles this zombie to protect Tony and the other villagers that have shown up, but uses an arm during the process. Arms are ancient weapons used during the war with the Metal Demons 1,000 years ago. Only select people can use the arms, as they have to synchronize their will to the weapon. Due to their connection to the war with the demons, many fear the arms and their destructive power. And that holds true for Surf Village. The people of the village banish Rudy, and he sets out yet again seeking a place to belong, making his way to the Kingdom of Adelheid. The next member of our triad is Treasure Hunter Jack and his Wind Mouse companion Hanpan. These two start their journey off exploring an ancient Elu ruin called the Memory Temple. They seek out the absolute power that Jack needs to grow stronger. When they reach the deepest floor of the Memory Temple, the two discover a hologram of an Elu. It warns them to seek not Lilithia, as she sleeps in her tomb. She is the Death Wind, the heartbeat of annihilation. Of course, rather than take this warning seriously, Jack comes to believe that Lilithia must be the absolute power that he's after. And so Jack and Hanpan head off to the Land of Light, where Lilithia is sealed making their way to the Kingdom of Adelheid. The final of our protagonist is Cecilia Lynn Adelheid, the young princess of the Kingdom of Adelheid. She spent her life training as a mage in the Curran Abbey to the southwest of the kingdom. The young princess is celebrating her 17th birthday, which means she's come of age and can return to her role as a member of the royal family. Cecilia is called to a hidden library in the Curran Abbey by an unknown voice. At the bottom of the library, she discovers a forbidden book, 
Sealed inside this is the demon Nogal. It seeks to drag the princess into the book, but she defeats it with her powerful magics. With the death of the demon, Stoldark appears to Cecilia. He's one of the guardians of Philgaia and was trapped in the book by Nogal. Stoldark reached out to Cecilia as she's the innocent one, a shaman that can connect with the guardians. He tells her that darkness is coming again to Philgaia and that it will all begin with Lilithia. The guardian then gives her his power in the form of a rune, which allows her to summon him in battle. She's transported out of the hidden library with Sister Mary, her primary teacher at the Abbey, waiting for her. Mary tells her that the female members of the Adelheid royal family share their thoughts with the Guardians, and that they have a destiny to fulfill. With this, Cecilia steals her resolve and leaves the Abbey, making her way to the kingdom of Adelheid. And with this, each of the three protagonists of Wild Arms are finally together in one place. While in Adelheid, the characters run across the eccentric Professor Emma. She's seeking help at a recent excavation site, and as fate dictates, this excavation is taking place at the Tomb of Lilithia, north of Adelheid, which is suffering the fallout from the earthquake caused by Rudy. So of course our three heroes agree to help and set off to the Tomb of Lilithia, where they discover the sleeping golem Lilithia. Golems are ancient weapons created by the Elu to battle the demons 1,000 years ago. After the battle, many of these golems were sealed off in ancient ruins. The big problem with golems is that they can be controlled by more than just the Elu or humans. Even demons, if able to capture and reprogram them, can manipulate the giant stone warriors. After helping excavate Lilithia, Rudy, Jack, and Cecilia agree to stick around Adelheid until Professor Emma can pay them. This has them planning to attend a festival taking place the following day. In true JRPG fashion, the festival holds many mini-games that Rudy and the crew can take part in. They also get to see Lilithia being shown off at the festival, as well as two other golems, Barbados and Diablo, that were excavated by Emma. And while everything seems like it's going great, destruction is just about to befall the Kingdom of Adelheid. The sky itself begins to crack as the barrier between dimensions is broken, and pouring forth from that hole are demons. These demons, led by Belsic, wreak havoc upon the kingdom, killing many of its people and setting buildings ablaze. Rudy and the crew save as many people as they can before fleeing into the relative safety of the castle. Belsuk isn't done just yet, though. Not only has he stolen the three golems at the festival, he's also going to completely wipe out the kingdom if the heroes don't turn over the teardrop. This is a powerful heirloom of Adelheid passed down through the generations, with Cecilia being the current holder. The princess can't just sit around and let the people of Adelheid be hurt. Instead, she goes against her father's wishes and sneaks out to hand the teardrop over to Belsuk. The Demon General agrees to leave the kingdom after getting the teardrop, and Cecilia hands it over. And in what might be the most surprising unintended twist in a JRPG, Belsic really does plan to stick to his word. It's here that we start to learn a little bit more about Jack. He's fueled by revenge, and can't just let Belsic leave unscathed. The treasure hunter challenges the demon and a fight ensues, but the party isn't up to snuff, and Belsic can't even be bothered to kill them. Afterwards, Cecilia tells her father about losing the teardrop. The king warns his daughter that she must get the teardrop back, before succumbing to the wounds he suffered during the attack. After some harsh words from Jack, Cecilia agrees to accept a responsibility and reclaim the teardrop. She cuts her hair as a sign that she's ready to travel, and the group departs Adelheid after laying the king to rest. With the advice of the Chancellor, Cecilia and the group head to Milama. After the crew reaches Milama, they learn of the Guardian Shrine located outside the village. They travel there and face a series of physical and mental tests. Each of these give us more insight into the three characters, as well as highlights each of their desires not to be alone anymore. For Jack, this sees him finding a sword that could be the absolute power he seeks for revenge, only for it to catch fire and disappear. He's then confronted by a shadowed group of knights that tear him down for being a coward and running away from his friends, responsibilities, and himself. They tell him that a coward can destroy, but the true power is that of protection. Jack confirms this himself and asks the Shadowed Knights to please be patient as he keeps searching for this power. When the knights start to disappear, Jack calls out in fear of being alone again. In Rudy's case, he sees the image of Tony about to be attacked by a monster. Rudy slays the demon, but Tony calls him a monster too. The various villagers from Surf start appearing and telling Rudy he's a danger, that arms could be tied to demons, and that he's a stranger nobody wants in this world. When Rudy looks into the mirror, he's shocked to see his reflection matches that of a demon. The scene finishes with Tony telling Rudy that Philgaia isn't for him, and he doesn't belong here. Rudy falls to his knees upon hearing this, as the scene fades out. Cecilia deals with her own vision as well. It drags her back to Adelheid Castle, with several characters appearing and addressing her, but none of them call her by her name. 
They even point out that Cecilia as a person doesn't matter. Only her princess status gives her worth. An image of her own father appears to tell her that she shouldn't be surprised as no one loves her. Finally, an image of Cecilia in her princess attire materializes. She criticizes Cecilia for going on the adventure as she only went to find love. The mimic says that she's only saving the world because she as a princess has to, and that nobody loves her and she loves no one. With the three of our heroes thoroughly mentally thrashed by the test of the Guardians, they're immediately met with even more criticism. The three Guardians housed in this shrine make no effort to hide the fact that they have little hope for humanity. They call the heroes weak-willed and lacking in power to defeat the demons. And even with that said, these beings know they have no other hope of continuing their existence without the help of humans. With this, the Guardians tell Rudy, Jack, and Cecilia that the demons plan to use the stolen teardrop to revive their mother. The Guardians attempt to transport the group to the demons' base, but Siegfried stops them with his own power. This has the scene shifting to the demons' point of view as he curses the Guardians for scanning the base. It also introduces us to the other three members of the Quarter Knights, Lady Harkin, Alhazad, and Belsic. Lady Harkin is worried about the humans and Guardians working together, but Siegfried isn't. He points to the decaying world of Philgaia and human weakness as reason not to worry about the two groups working together. Alzahad agrees, and says that without the Elu, the humans don't stand a chance. The Quarter Knights depart to destroy the Guardian Seal that binds their mother, who sleeps in a giant cocoon. Before the scene ends, Siegfried wonders if the other Quarter Knights will share his and mother's dream when she awakens. And now, I want to take a second to rewind real quick. While this scene is likely supposed to have a lot of impact on the player, it might not. See, Wild Arms does this weird thing where it hides part of its main story behind the title screen. Basically, when players boot up the game, they see this amazing anime opening with Rudy, Jack, and Cecilia. After this finishes out, players are taken to the title screen for the game. And while it would make sense to go ahead and start playing, that's not what you should do. Instead, let the game sit for a bit. After doing so, a second opening will play. This one uses in-game graphics to show a series of events that take place a few years before the start of the game. In this, we see a group of knights fleeing an attack. As they ride down a lift, they discuss the demons besieging the city. Before long, we see Alhazad appear. He seeks a cocoon located deep beneath the arctic castle these knights call home. One of the knights stays to fend him off while the other two, Garrett and Elmina, flee from the castle to warn the world that the demons have returned. It's clear that Elmina and Garrett have a thing for each other, but there's one problem. She's injured and can't escape alongside Garrett. Against his wishes, Elmina drops the gate behind him, sealing her in with the demons and ensuring his escape. The young knight Garrett that we saw in this scene is Jack before his treasure hunter days. Wild Arms treats this as a bit of a secret for a while, but it's fairly obvious so long as you don't miss that opening cutscene. Going back to the present, the three heroes come across the village of Baskar, which is home to a clan that follows the Elu lifestyle. The chief of this village tells them that the demons seek to destroy three guardian statues that each hold a piece of Mother's heart. We're going to skip a little bit of the story here to save time, but just know that Rudy, Jack, and Cecilia fail each time to stop the demons from destroying the Guardian statues and retrieving the pieces of Mother's Heart. We also meet a few other characters during this, such as the arm-wielder Calamity Jane, the goofy demon Zed, and Captain Bartholomew. I also want to highlight Saint Centaur, a town with a protective barrier that holds one of the heart pieces the demons seek. The demons can't get through the barrier, but that doesn't stop them. Instead, we learn that people from town have gone missing, only to reappear a time after with a gap in their memories. After returning from a demon experimentation lab, we find the town statue destroyed and it's overrun with demons, leaving a blind girl as the only survivor. The game doesn't come out and say it just yet, but it's clear what happened. Those kidnapped people were experimented on by Alhazad. He placed demon seeds inside of them and let them go back into the town. Then, once they were past the barrier, the demons inside the people burst out from within them and started killing villagers until the town was almost empty. With all of the statues destroyed, Mother's Revival begins as Stoldark warns the heroes about her return. We witness this ourselves with the Quarter Knights greeting Mother as she revives. She tells them it's time to move forward with her plan to destroy Philgaia, which throws Siegfried and the other Quarter Knights off guard. They believed they would rule Philgaia in place of the humans, but that's not so. Mother intends to destroy Philgaia in the same way she has every other planet she's visited. She even clarifies that this was the case with Hades, the planet the Quarter Knights believe to be their home. Siegfried isn't sure what to make of this, and asks Mother what will happen to them after Philgaia's destruction. 
She tells him that he, along with the rest of her children, will be consumed by her, as there is no greater heaven in the universe than to become part of her. This is the kind of thing that makes Mother one of the most standout villains in a JRPG to me. She travels around destroying planets just to see the beauty that occurs when all life is wiped out. And then, to top it off, she simply eats her own children before heading to the next planet and repeating the cycle. And she presents all of this as if it's the greatest honor in the universe. I know it's dang near comical evil, but it really works for me and sets her up well as a boss that the player wants to stop at all cost. After this, the crew travels around the world trying to find their way to the demon's castle on the northern Arctic continent. It takes a bit to get there with a sand cave, flying garden, ghost ship, and more before we even come close to getting there. One part of this that's worth pointing out is our stay at Rosetta Town. This has us finding a lone Elu girl named Mariel living in the town all by herself. The other villagers are suspicious of her, and she has a bad reputation as a result. Despite this, she seeks to help the mayor, who's suffering from an illness she knows how to cure. This leads to a conflict with the mayor's son as he seeks to torment Mariel, but Rudy isn't having any of that. Without any hesitation, he jumps forward and decks the kid right in the face. Luckily, it all works out well in the end, with the mayor cured and the town being more accepting of Mariel. This is also where we run into Calamity Jane for a second time. She needs help getting a treasure from Vulcan and Trap, and the group agrees to help her. We run into Zed for the second time here and beat him again. Zed's part of the demon army, by the way, but is much more of a comic relief character and really doesn't fit in with them. Our adventure in Vulcan and Trap comes to a head in the final battle with Belsic, although we aren't the ones to kill him. Instead, he's taken out by Boomerang, a new demon face that's working on the orders of Mother. She sends him out to defeat those chosen by the Guardians while also setting up a barrier around the demon base to prevent the humans from interrupting her while she regains her strength. After all of this, we finally have the means to open Giant's Cradle, and inside is the Earth Golem. Yep, one of the major weapons from the War with Demons 1000 years ago is now under our control. The Golem isn't too keen on waking up and fighting again, but it does so after Cecilia sits down and has a heart-to-heart -heart talk with it. Her understanding that the Golem doesn't want to be just a weapon of war encourages it to aid our heroes. While we can finally approach the demon base photosphere, we can't get past its impenetrable shield. So with some additional wandering, we find a town of engineers. Among them is one that is a former disciple of Rudy's grandfather, Zepet Rough Knight. These engineers could upgrade the stone golem, but to do so they'll need the rune drive, which is located in Zepet's old workshop, the Epitaph Sea. While navigating the abandoned tower, the group is aided by Lucide, the Guardian of Desire. However, this guardian leads them to Boomerang. It turns out that Boomerang's desire for a challenging battle is so strong that Lucide is unable to die while fighting alongside him. I always found this to be an interesting twist. The idea of a guardian of Philgaia just saying, screw it, this demon has more desire than all of humanity combined. I'm sticking with him. Really hammers home just how poor of a state the world is in. After returning to town, Alhazad appears and threatens to destroy the village. This causes all of the villagers to flee to the nearby sacred shrine, which has a barrier similar to the one in Saint Centaur. A few of them get lost along the way, but they do reappear, and as I'm sure you can guess, they act as vessels for demons sneaking into the shrine. After giving Alzahad the old 1-2, we grab the rune drive and upgrade the stone golem, finally giving us the ability to attack the photosphere. Once inside, the group is aided by a robed figure. This mysterious person guides them to Cecilia's teardrop and tells them that now is their only chance to defeat Mother. On our way to her, we end up battling the golem Walithia, which has been reprogrammed by the demons. With our heroes finally reaching Mother, she tells them that she is death and that she has destroyed countless star systems in her travels. Yet again, I really have to point out just how hard Wild Arms goes in making Mother evil. This whole death of countless star systems thing is part of that. She's kind of like Lavos on steroids, except even Lavos creates offspring to send off to other planets. Mother just eats her own children once they've served their purpose and moves on to the next planet. She really dials it up to 11 on the evil meter. Heck, even after the group beats her, she's not all that upset. Instead, she starts going on about seeing the true beauty in the scattering of self, and taunts the protagonist by telling them they'll sink into the sea alongside her and the photosphere. Obviously, this doesn't happen with Calamity Jane and the Captain coming to save the day. Even with Mother dead, the Quarter Knights show up to make it known that they will kill the Guardians protecting the planet. Also, the cloaked figure that helped the group get the teardrop back was actually Siegfried. 
Turns out he wasn't too keen on Mother's plan to destroy the world, and even blames her for destroying his home world. Now the demon's goal is ridding Felgaia of humans to make it their new home. Rudy, Jack, and Cecilia aren't about to let that happen, and form a reconnaissance team with the help of Professor Emma to learn what the demons are up to. This has them exploring with Bartholomew's ship, and strangely enough, Cecilia hears a voice calling to her from a whirlpool. Speaking to her is Lucadia, the Sea Dragon, yet another guardian of Filgaia. There's a lot of these guys. The group drops into the Dragon Shrine at the bottom of the sea and meets up with Lucadia. And man, does he talk a big game. He goes on about Mother now being his nourishment after her death, and also tells the group that the demons intend to sever the Ray Line, which acts as the source of all life on the planet. And with perfect timing, Lady Harkin appears to confirm that this is exactly what the demons plan to do. She squares off in a battle against the crew, but flees after losing control of her body. Afterwards, Jack makes sure to mention that her techniques look a lot like his fast draw abilities. But surely that's just a coincidence, right? No matter the case, Lucadia offers his strength to the heroes, and they set off on their ship now able to explore even more of Felgaia, with the whirlpool no longer limiting them to the inner sea. This has them eventually stumbling upon a demon lab located on an island. When entering, we're treated to a cutscene of Lady Harkin wondering why her and Jack's techniques look alike. She's also struggling with a severe case of amnesia, and lashes out at Alzahad when he tries to woo her. While in the lab, the group gains access to the demon's archives, which reveal some of their plans. That includes their discovery of the Darkness Tear, a counter to the teardrop that emits anti-life energy. We also hear a bit about something called a Demon Gate, as well as the fact that seven of the eight golems, including the recently retrieved Leviathan, are armed and ready to fight for the demons. Also, the Barbados golem they stole earlier was evidently uncontrollable, so the demons just dropped it off in the desert so they wouldn't have to deal with it. In the depths of the lab, we run into Lady Harkin once again, as well as the Darkness Tear. After some quick banter, the group defeats Harkin again, only for her to lose her demon form for a brief moment. If you've seen that second opening I mentioned earlier, then you now know that she is Elmina, the Sword Princess. Jack even alludes to this, but says he'll tell the group more at a later time. Alhazad sweeps in to steal Elmina and the Darkness Tear away before the heroes can claim them. There's also one final demon archive to read, which makes mention of something sealed by the Guardians called Kadingle. Yes, that's really its name. With some further exploring of Filgaia, the crew finds the Dead Sanctuary. It's here that we learn about the Guardian Lords, three omniscient beings that ruled over the other Guardians. These three reside in the forces of hope, courage, and love, which just so happen to be the defining characteristics of Rudy, Jack, and Cecilia. Further in the Sanctuary, we run into Boomerang and Lucid and give them another beating. Then we find the fossilized essences of the three Guardian Lords. The lack of hope, courage, and love in the world keeps them from taking their material form, and instead they ask Cecilia for help in returning their power. Cecilia agrees and gets a bit of a power boost to help her on her quest. When the group leaves the sanctuary, they're ambushed by an army of demons that come from the sky, just like an Adelhide. This is the Demon Gate, and it's powered by the Anti-Guardian, the Gate Generator. Our three heroes are teleported via the Demon Gate and do battle. Afterward, Siegfried warns them that battling in an unstable dimension is a bad idea, but they really didn't have a choice. After some Scooby-Doo shenanigans with Zed and a battle with the Diablo Golem, players find themselves face to face with Siegfried again. After a quick battle, Siegfried orders Zed to turn the gate generator to 200%. This will create a black hole, but the demon leader believes he can survive it. Rudy tries to stop this, but Siegfried ensnares his arm with a wire. Rudy attempts to cut it, but can't as it's made of magic silver. And in one of the most surprising and cool moments of the game, Rudy, without hesitation, slices off his own arm, and Siegfried is sucked into the black hole. Everyone else gets sucked in too, and they're stuck between dimensions until Cecilia harnesses the power of the teardrop to teleport them near Adelheid. Rudy obviously isn't doing well after cutting off his arm, and Cecilia tries to heal him, but instead a spark bursts from his body. And it's here where we learn that Rudy isn't human, he's a machine, just like the demons. This understandably freaks Cecilia out, and I get why since her father was killed by demons, but Jack steps up with some of my favorite dialogue in the game. He tells Cecilia that if they don't support Rudy through this, then who will? Jack points out that Rudy is physically shaking and that the young Dream Chaser himself doesn't know what is happening. He says that nobody wants to be an outsider, but Rudy just found out he is one, and that he's protected them all this time and it's their turn to do the same for him. This brings Cecilia back to her senses, and the two take Rudy to Professor Emma for help. After this, we change back over to Siegfried and see that he has indeed survived the black hole, and it's transported him back to the photosphere. 
he's still determined to eliminate the humans despite his injuries, but before he can go far, a familiar laugh echoes through the destroyed craft's control room. <laughs> The gelatinous remains of Mother drop from the ceiling behind Siegfried. She calls out to her child in broken speech and edges closer to him. The last thing we see before the scene fades to black is Mother about to encase the Quarter Knight. And then we hear crunching sounds as Mother speaks, saying, My sweet Zeke, from now on, me. Yet again, Mother is dang creepy. Also, I really have to question the E for Everyone rating on Wild Arms. Just so far, we've had Jack cursing, demons eating humans from the inside out, one character slicing off his own arm, and now a deformed slab of meat eating her own son with the crunching sounds of her consumption in the background. Like, I get it. It's not quite worthy of a T for Teen rating, and the E plus rating didn't exist when this game came out. But sometimes the game can get pretty dark. I guess hiding it behind bright pixel art was enough to throw off the ratings board. After this, we switch back to our heroes as Professor Emma tells them healing Rudy is beyond her. Besides the fact that he's made of metal, the rest of his body operates just like a human's would. This has the crew agreeing to go see Mariel for her special herbs, but not before Calamity Jane gives some not-so-subtle clues about her feelings for her fellow arms wielder, and tearing Cecilia a new one on her lack of love for her friend. If it's not clear already, Wild Arms has strong themes covering loneliness and love. Each of the three protagonists struggle with this in some way, but it's not just them. The Guardians suffer from loneliness as well, with humans turning their backs on them. Even Philgaia is dying due to a lack of care from humanity. And if we flip over to the demon's point of view, loneliness and love are yet again core themes through their journey. The desire to revive their mother and create a world of their own are rooted in this, even if it isn't quite hit on as much as it is with the humans. Moving on, the group seeks Muriel, who recognizes Rudy as having a body made with life within metal. She calls it a 1,000-year-old sin that's the result of humans and Elus working together to try and mimic demon bodies. While she could heal a small wound with her herbs, replacing a whole arm is beyond anybody's abilities still on Vilgaia. This has Muriel leading the party to the Forest Mound, and it's here that we learn that the Elu left Vilgaia 1,000 years ago. They took a portion of Vilgaia into a new world called the Elu Dimension. Mariel slices open her own hand to open the gate to the Elu Dimension. She does so while explaining that the Elu create bonds. That includes a bond to time that lets them live eternally, a bond to the land to enjoy nature, and that they will give up anything to bond with those they believe in. Mariel reminds the group that Rudy saved her in the forest, and now she'll do anything to save him. With her blood spilling on the altar, the group is teleported to the Elu Dimension. Mariel's not doing well after her blood loss, and the group leaves to find her help. Unfortunately, the group doesn't get the warmest welcome from the Elu, who really have a chip on their shoulder about the whole war 1,000 years ago. They've also got that typical elf high and mighty attitude that has them looking down on humans as foolish. Despite all of this, the Elu does explain more about Rudy. We learn he's the culmination of the Homecross Project, a plan to create metal warriors with hearts to combat the demons. This saw them combining the living metal of demons with the physiology of humans. That created what the Elu leader calls the ultimate enhancement to arms. While there were several home cross in the war, each of them succumbed to bloodlust and became ruthless killing machines. The Elu aren't sure if the demon bodies or humanity's desire for war are to blame for the artificial being's corruption. All that were deployed in the war have been destroyed, but Rudy never took part in the war and is the only remaining home cross. Rudy, being raised by Zepet as a normal human, never found himself drawn to darkness. His life as a human gave him a pure heart. And it's at this point I have to ask if that's really a surprise. These Elu act like they're so wise, but they don't understand why creating a life form to serve solely as a weapon would result in it becoming a ruthless killing machine? Then they have the audacity to try and pawn off the blame on the humans or the demons without thinking they might have had a part in it. What a bunch of douches. We do learn that Mariel's brother, Vassim, may be able to create a second Guardian Blade that could heal Rudy. He wielded the original one in the war 1,000 years ago, and it's a form of metal with its own life. 
Vasim does agree to help Rudy, but first we'll need the power of the Life Force and Illusion Guardians, so we do that lickety split and reforge the Guardian Blade as Rudy's new arm. But he still remains in a sleeping state. It's at this point that Cecilia is pulled into Rudy's dreams. This gives us a look into what it was like for Rudy growing up, because yes, he did indeed start out as a child and grew over time. In his dreams, we see that Rudy wasn't always treated the best by other kids. His strength and powers made him a social outcast, and with his heart hurting, he seeks the comfort of his memories of his adopted grandfather. But Cecilia knows that Rudy can't always run away from his fear of loneliness and encourages him to stop living in the past. This results in Cecilia battling Elizabeth, a demon that feeds on dreams. Cecilia defeats the demon and, after watching Rudy's memories, comes to some own conclusions about herself. She overcomes the idea that people only see her as a princess and realizes that she's the one pushing people away. She learns that before she can love herself, she first has to love other people. This realization causes the goddess idol to shatter, and from it comes Rafina, the guardian of love. Rafina asks Cecilia why she fights, and Cecilia responds that it was at first because she's a princess and shaman of the guardians, but now she's realized it's because she loves Filgaia and her friends. This is the true power of love, and Rafina agrees to assist Cecilia in her battle against the demons. Cecilia awakens after this to find Rudy recovered from the surgery and ready to resume their quest. When they return to Filgaia, Calamity Jane is waiting for them. She takes them back to Adelheid, and we get to see the Proto-Wing, a flying device made by Emma based on Zeppet's designs. But it needs more power before it can reach the upper atmosphere. This has Emma sending two groups out to find Gemini circuits. Rudy's covers the air in the Proto-Wing, and Jane's the sea via the ship. Rudy's group finds their Gemini circuit easily enough, but Jane's runs into some trouble. While they get the circuit, they're attacked by the Leviathan Golem. This sinks their ship, but it's not the biggest loss. We already know that any sunken treasure ends up in the ship graveyard. So with the second Gemini circuit in hand, we return to Professor Emma and give the Proto-Wing the final upgrade it needs to become the Gullwing. Now we can travel over mountain ranges, which opens up loads of new areas to explore in Filgaia. And the first place we're going to check out is the Demon Castle Pandemonium. This is one of those places that players can see earlier in the game, but can't get to as it's on an island surrounded by mountains. While inside Pandemonium, the group encounters Lady Harkin, who immediately transforms back into Elmina. Then Alhazad appears, saying that Elmina is important to the Metal Demon's plans. He sicks another demon named Tarask on them and captures Jack and the others after the battle. The three heroes escape Pandemonium's dungeon by defeating its demon jailer. After progressing through the castle again, they come across the Darkness Tier, with Lady Harkin sealed inside. It's here that we learn Siegfried has survived, even if he won't show his face, and that he seeks to use the anti-life energy of the Darkness Tier to destroy the Ray Line and Filgaia itself. Alhazad also chimes in to make clear that Lady Harkin slash Elmina is being used as a new mother to channel the energy of the Darkness Tier. The Metal Demons make use of the Elu Pyramids and satellites connected to them to spread the energy of the Darkness Tier across Filgaia. I didn't mention those earlier, but they connect various parts of Filgaia via satellites and teleporters. And it's worth pointing out that the Metal Demons' plan does succeed to a degree. While Filgaia isn't outright destroyed, the planet becomes engulfed in earthquakes, tornadoes, and tidal waves as the link between the planet and the Guardians is further weakened. But before this can reach completion, Jack is able to shatter the Darkness Tier and free Elmina, who quickly turns back into Lady Harkin and flees. Jack, injured and distraught, laments his inability to save his love before passing out. While the Darkness Tier didn't do what Alhazad said it would, it did open the way for the Metal Demons to Kadingle, the tower reaching the heavens. This was, apparently, the true goal of Siegfried's experiment with the Darkness Tier. Getting back to Jack, we get a flashback to his time as one of the seven Fenrir Knights of Arctica. We learn that each of these knights are named after a part of a knight's attire. For Jack, he was given the name of Van Burris, since he protects the sword maiden Elmina. And I just have to interject here real quick, that's weird. The game clearly calls him Jack Van Burris, but I think that's a mistranslation of Vambrace, which is basically a forearm guard. All of these memories reignite Jack's courage, and he asks Rudy and Cecilia to accompany him to Castle Arctica so he can take care of some unfinished business. That unfinished business being a one-on-one -on -one battle between Jack and Lady Harkin in the depths of the castle. And this turns out to be their final battle, with Lady Harkin telling Jack that he finally looks like a knight. With Jack holding the dying Elmina, a light burst forth from within him. She tells him that this is the absolute power he's been seeking. 
It's the power of love that gives him the courage to wield his blade. Before dying, she asks Jack to protect this world that brought them together. Jack agrees, saying that he'll no longer fight for revenge. This causes the lion idol he's carrying to shatter, with the reawakened Guardian of Courage allying itself to Jack. And with Jack finally obtaining his courage, he's ready to defend Filgaia. When the party leaves Castle Arctica, the Guardians react to the teardrop. While the ray line wasn't severed, it weakened them long enough for Siegfried to find Kadingle deep in the ocean. Using this chance, he brings back the tower that allowed the humans and Elu to travel between Filgaia and a large colony that floats above the planet. With Kadingle unlocked, we could go ahead and wrap up this story, but there's a few things left for us to do yet. The first of these is returning to the village of Baskar. It's here that the Guardians of Love and Courage attempt to revive the Guardian of Hope. Despite their best efforts, they can't bring the Light of Hope back to Filgaia. But Rudy, even though his heart is artificial, has enough hope within him for the future. Despite his loneliness, Rudy's love of Filgaia and its people give him the hope to keep moving forward. And it's that same hope that revives the Guardian of Hope. It aligns itself with Rudy on his quest to save Filgaia. Another of the side quests that players will want to complete have them returning to St. Centaur. The blind girl living in the village is being taken care of by Zed. He ended up here after the incident with the gate generator and decided to help the girl. While he initially fights the group, he asks them to spare his life so that he may keep living with her. They agree, and Zed promises to take up a new role as a guardian of Filgaia. In a strange twist of events, Zed finds himself more at home with a human, as compared to the loneliness he felt seeking the approval of his fellow demons. After this, players will definitely want to check out the Illusion Temple. It's here that they meet the Guardian of Time Space. It tells them that Elmina's soul remains trapped between dimensions, but with the help of the Guardian of Life, she can be brought back. Jack agrees to this, but only if the Guardian can turn back time on her heart so that she has no memories of being Lady Harkin. The Guardian says that this is possible, but she also won't remember Jack. That's a sacrifice he's willing to make, and Elmina is resurrected somewhere in Filgaia. This has the players actually able to find Elmina working in a pub in Malama Village. Jack recognizes her immediately, even if she can't do the same with him. While there's no major conclusion to this, like Elmina remembering who she or Jack is, it is a nice way to tie up their story, and I question making it optional. Another bit of side questing requires us to first head off to Kandingle real quick. Boomerang and Lucide are waiting at the entrance, and after a battle, the two sacrifice themselves to stop a group of demons seeking to kill the heroes. After this, players can head off to Filgaia's arena to find Boomerang reborn as Boomerang Flash. His desire fused with Lucide and created a new Guardian Blade, while also transforming him into Boomerang Flash. This allowed the two to escape Hell itself and take on Rudy and the gang one last time. When defeated, Boomerang realizes that it's humanity's capability to create miracles that makes them strong. He also goes down with honor, saying that he lived the good life of a demon, fighting and dying in glory. His defeat nets Rudy the Divine Blade, which is his ultimate weapon. I'm actually going to jump ahead here a little bit and talk about Ragu Ragula. He's the strongest boss in Wild Arms, with the game literally saying there's no match for him on Filgaia. Ragu is an interesting optional boss to me. He's called the King of Beasts and came from the Sea of Stars. He was so powerful that he was sealed away in the Abyss, a secret dungeon only accessible by malfunctioning an Elu Pyramid. The reason Ragu sticks out to me so much is that the game never calls him a demon, at least not from what I can remember. Despite that, he does come from space, just as the Metal Demon race does. It also makes me wonder if he would be comparable to a father of the demons that complements Mother, or if he's a completely different race altogether. There are monsters, or beasts if you will, on Filgaia that aren't demons, so I'm leaning on the latter, but really can't be sure. Either way, defeating Ragu Ragula nets players the Sheriff Star, which is the most powerful accessory in the game and overkill since we've already beaten the hardest boss Wild Arms has to offer. And with that, we are finally ready to climb Kadingle. On our way up, we run into Alzahad, who reveals his true form before getting smacked around by our now insanely overpowered party. With his defeat, we can now use Kadingle to teleport to Malduk. This is the new moon that hangs in the skies above Filgaia. It's actually a second moon created by the Elu and humans that fell into disrepair after the war 1,000 years ago. Siegfried and the other demons plan to claim it for their own. After more battles against golems taken over by the demons, Rudy, Cecilia, and Jack finally find themselves face to face with Siegfried once more. 
The demon leader plans to use the weapons on Malduk to destroy Filgaia, but Rudy and the gang aren't going to let that happen. After a climactic battle, Siegfried is still dedicated to engulfing Filgaia in darkness to kill off the humans. This is when Mother makes her return. She remained inside of Siegfried, influencing him and eating away at him from the inside out. Now she is reborn in the body that she previously birthed and calls herself Motherfried, the ultimate beauty. I think Jack sums up this whole situation best when he states that this is getting out of hand. Even after the group takes down Motherfried, she tells them that she can't die as there will always be a place for her at the end of time. I'd have liked a bit more on all of this and how combining with her child basically caused her to ascend to a higher existence, but it's never elaborated on. Even with Motherfried dead, Filgaia is still covered in darkness, but not for long. Cecilia, Jack, and Rudy refuse to let the planet die. Their wishes create a miracle as the teardrop begins to brightly glow. A glow that hasn't been seen since before the war 1000 years ago. A glow that previously signaled the health of the planet. With this power, the Guardians return and banish the darkness from Filgaia. This is the absolute power. The faith that can create a better future. The planet can still recover from its decay, so long as humans have hope, as they are revealed to be the true guardians of Filgaia. With the world saved, Rudy, Jack, and Cecilia set out to return to Filgaia. While traveling between Malduk and Kadingle, the group is attacked by Siegfried for one final battle. Now calling himself Zeke Tuvai, the demon lord split off from Mother and returned to Filgaia from Hell through sheer force of will. His extreme desire for revenge has transformed him into a living blade, and he intends to kill our heroes in the artificial realm between the land and the sky. Even after being defeated by the group, Siegfried is still satisfied. His battle made the Dimensional Rift unstable, and he claims that all of them will be blown away. He's partially right as the group ends up outside of Kadingle and next to the Earth Golem. The space elevator is unstable from the battle and about to blow. The Earth Golem responds on its own, stepping between the group and Kadingle. It raises its shields and protects the group from the explosion. Unlike all of the other Golems, it has attained a will of its own and uses it to save our heroes. But it's not without cost. The Earth Golem loses one of its arms in the process and falls back into a deep slumber. After the explosion, Cecilia tells the Golem that next time it wakes up, it won't be used for war. Instead, it will find a Filgaia covered in nature and filled with joyous people. Fast forward and we see Jack, Handpan, and Rudy leaving Adelheid to take up dream chasing once more. The three read a letter from Cecilia who explains that she believed the three of them would always be together. She tells them that their decision to leave shocked her, but that their help in carrying the burden to save Filgaia eased her lonely heart. This happens as we see various scenes of what the group was doing during their time after returning from Malduk and before they left Adelheid. This culminates with Cecilia promising to seek out the new desire in her heart. She'll no longer be the perfect princess of Adelheid, and will instead embrace life as an ordinary 17-year-old girl. Just like Jack and Rudy, she wants to do more for Filgaia, to protect that which she cares for. Her letter closes out by telling Jack and Rudy that they should be receiving something they left in Adelheid soon. The two, being a bit thick, don't know what this means. Instead, Jack berates Rudy for forgetting something, and Hampan argues it was probably Jack that forgot. After this, Cecilia runs out from behind a tree and reveals that she's joining them as a fellow dream chaser. Our story closes with the three standing on a cliff overlooking a forest. They talk about what's happened and everyone that made it possible. With this, the camera pans upwards as a group of birds fly by overhead, signaling that nature is returning to Filgaia. The story of Wild Arms is amazing. While not as complex as some of the other JRPGs that came out in this era, it has its own charm that I love. Its themes of loneliness and destruction being overcome by love, courage, and hope resonate with me. I'm not ashamed to say I'm a sucker for this kind of romanticism. I also really dig how the demons work into these themes with their own loneliness fueling their actions. Siegfried is the main source of this, as he wants a place to call home and the love of his mother, He's an excellent counter to Rudy, who constantly traveled and couldn't fit in with others due to his metal body. But whereas Rudy had the positive reinforcement of his adopted grandfather and friends to give him hope, Siegfried only had the twisted love of his mother. There are also elements of Cecilia in him as well. His lust for power to rule over Filgaia is the exact opposite of Cecilia's desire to escape ruling over the people of Adelheid. 
To go along with that, Cecilia is reunited with her father after years in the Abbey, only to have him taken from her by the demons. On the flip side of that, when Siegfried finally got his mother back, he ended up being joined with her physically as another of her warped acts of love. And we see the clear connections between Siegfried and Jack in the final battle. He became consumed by his desire for revenge, even going so far as to twist his body into the revenge blade. It's a path Jack could have just as easily had taken with his thirst for revenge against the demons, but with the help of Elmina, he overcame the loneliness that fueled his revenge, and instead drew on his own courage to protect Filgaia, which runs opposite of Siegfried's desire to destroy the planet. Moving on from the story, Wild Arms offers some of the tightest traditional turn-based combat there is. And I don't mean just for its time, either. The three roles that Rudy, Jack, and Cecilia serve in the game play perfectly off of each other. Rudy takes on the job of a tank, with his natural defenses and abilities focused on that. At the same time, his damage is nothing to laugh at, with his various arms being able to decimate normal enemies and also stack up the damage on bosses. Jack is the main physical damage dealer of the group with his quick draw abilities and high attack. However, he's also a great healer in a pinch, with his speed giving him the ability to take turns before anyone else. That easily lets him use items at crucial moments that could otherwise spell death for the party. Finally, Cecilia is our mage of all types with the ability to wield both white and black magic. She also holds the summoner job as well with abilities built for it, even if every other character can summon guardians into battle. The different abilities each of these characters bring to battle are wonderful, and players unlock more throughout the story. They're called force abilities. They build up in battle from being attacked and grant players access to different options. For example, Rudy can choose to gain 100% accuracy with a chosen arm that turn, Jack can guarantee that he takes the first action, and Cecilia will eventually gain the ability to cast two spells at once. Since Wild Arms runs off of a pure turn-based system, players don't have to worry about guessing when their characters will act. They can rely off of remembering details about different enemies to get a feel for battle. That doesn't mean an enemy won't occasionally take a turn earlier than expected, but it's reliable enough that it makes for great planning when setting each character's actions at the start of a turn. Outside of battles, Wild Arms features top-down navigation through towns, the world map, and dungeons. Setting the game apart is a dash button that has the characters taking off in the direction they're facing. Players can let off of this button and press it again to change direction. It's a little weird at first, but kind of gives off a feeling of drifting around turns while navigating areas. It's a small detail, but one that I greatly enjoy. And while we're talking about exploring, dungeons are often filled with puzzles and traps for players to make it through. A lot of the puzzles are just simple block ones, but there are others that might stump players for a while. Unfortunately, that's sometimes for the wrong reasons, as there are a couple in the game that just really don't make much sense. On that same note, players can also collect different tools for each character to use. These are vital for solving some of the dungeons and progressing. A few examples include a grappling hook for Jack, rocket boots for Rudy, and a watch that reverses time for Cecilia. While we're talking about Cecilia, I want to bring up magic in Wild Arms. Players can't just use whatever they want and first have to obtain crest graphs. After doing so, they can take these to guild locations and craft them into spells. There are plenty of spells for battle that include damage and healing, but also others that make getting through areas easier, or warping the player back to the start of a dungeon. One thing to note is that players get to name the spells they create. I love this as it adds a little extra flair, and I always enjoy giving spells somewhat goofy names. There are also pre-existing names for players that don't like fun. Since we're already on the subject, I want to offer up a quick piece of advice to anyone planning to play Wild Arms. Steal often. Jack gains the Trickster Quick Draw ability to steal from enemies early in the game, and it makes playing through Wild Arms so much easier. Players can get a surprising amount of rare items, such as bullet clips that reload Rudy's ammo mid-battle, and magic carrots for restoring MP from enemies. If you want to make this even easier, then make sure to increase Jack's res stat for a higher chance to steal, and also use secret signs to reduce its mana cost to 1. Speaking of quick draw abilities, I also enjoy that Jack doesn't just get them straight out. Instead, he can find hints throughout the game that give him ideas for new attacks. Players can then use the unknown ability in battle until Jack finally learns it. And Rudy isn't left out of the fun either. He can collect all sorts of different arms from special chests in the game. The player can take these to arm meisters which can upgrade their damage, accuracy, magazine size, and more, for a cost. All of these features come together to create the incredibly solid gameplay of Wild Arms. The amount of care that goes into all of these little details is really what makes me love the game, and is part of the charm that draws me into it. You know what else I find charming about Wild Arms? The graphics. 
While Wild Arms is a PS1 game, it didn't fully embrace 3D. Instead, the 3D is reserved for battles while the rest of the game makes use of detailed 2D sprites. Some might find this a bit jarring, but I quite like it, especially the chibi 3D models that show up in battle. It feels like a perfect evolution of the sprites used in 2D Final Fantasy games. It also certainly aged better than some of Square's early 3D games, and that's coming from somebody who loves the goofy block characters from Final Fantasy VII. And complementing all of this is Wild Arms' wonderful soundtrack. The game is filled to the rim with great tracks, such as the music that plays during battles, boss battles, as well as the opening theme, which I think has been on every MP3 player I've owned since MP3 players came into existence. There's plenty of other tunes to love in the game as well, but those are just a few of them that have always stuck out to me as personal favorites. All in all, Wild Arms is one of my favorite games. I've played through it a handful of times now and always love going back to it. I consider it the peak of what a good turn-based RPG can be without moving into the territory of greatness. And to be honest, if I was just going to give it a score based on my personal taste, I'd just plainly say it is a great JRPG. But I'm trying to be at least a little bit objective here. The biggest problem with Wild Arms is the difficulty in playing it, and I don't mean that it's a hard game. Instead, it's that the game can be hard to find and expensive. A physical copy of the game is going for about $65 right now. I should also mention that there's a remake for the PS2 called Alter Code F, but I've never played it and don't currently own a copy, so I can't say much about it. Even if I could find a copy, I'm not too crazy about shelling out $180 bucks for it. If you're willing to jump through some hoops, the game can still be bought on PSN at the time of making this video, but with the current issues plaguing that storefront, I don't know if I can recommend going that route. I do happen to own a few other games in this series. That includes Wild Arms 2 and 3, which I plan to review in the future. I've got no idea when that'll be, so don't go expecting those videos anytime soon. And with that, we've finished up this incredibly long review of Wild Arms for the PS1. Seriously, I severely underestimated how big this video was going to be. I definitely still want to cover more JRPGs in the future, but might need to reevaluate how I plan to do so considering how long this one took to make. Thank you so much for watching. You are more than welcome to like, comment, subscribe, and as always, take it easy.